Hello. At this point in the course, uh, you have seen Newton's laws of motion and we have introduced the concept of energy. When the forces are conservative, we can define a potential energy. Together with kinetic energy, uh, the total energy of the system is conserved when there are no dissipative forces in the system. In this chapter, we will introduce the concept of momentum and see under certain conditions this will give us another conserved quantity and a conservation law. In order to do this, we will first define the concept of momentum and see how it changes with time. This will be related to a quantity called impulse, which is the cumulative effect of the force over time. Then we will move on to a system of particles and look at the total momentum. This will be related uh, to a coordinate called the center of mass of the system. And we will study the motion of the center of mass under external forces and also when the particles are interacting with each other. Then we will see that when the total external force on a system vanishes, that is, we have an isolated system, the total momentum of the system will be conserved. This is the conservation of momentum. This is an extremely useful concept when we study collisions at the end of this chapter. We will distinguish between elastic and inelastic collisions depending on whether the kinetic energy is conserved or not. Let us start by rewriting Newton's second law. For a particle, uh, Newton's second law says the net force on the particle, which is the sum of all the forces acting on it, is equal to mass times its acceleration. So acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So let me write this quantity as the derivative of mass times velocity. So, and in that way, obtain, define the momentum. So, the momentum of a particle is equal to its mass times its velocity. And Newton's second law can be rewritten as the force being equal to the rate of change of momentum. So this is in fact general because it also applies to cases where the mass is changing. Therefore, the force can be interpreted as the instantaneous change of momentum. When the total force on a particle is zero, we see that the rate of change of momentum is zero and therefore the momentum of the particle is constant. It will be constant in time. Momentum is a vector quantity. Therefore, when it is conserved, each component will be constant in time. These components are Px equals m times vx, etc. Right? Similar for the y and z components in three dimensions. The units of momentum are kilogram times meter per second in standard units. Similar to the instantaneous change, we can also ask what is finite amount of change of momentum over a certain time interval. So, namely, we would like to find what is
delta p. So this can again be found by using uh, the second law and we will obtain that this will be given by an integral of the force over time, say from T1 to T2. We also give this quantity a name. It will be called the impulse. Notice this relation that we obtained, delta P, the change in momentum equals J, which is the impulse, is similar to the kinetic energy work theorem. There, the change in kinetic energy was given in terms of an integral of the force over distance. And the work done was equal to the kinetic energy. Here, the integral of the force is over time and the change is in momentum. As an example, let us consider bouncing of a wall from a wall as shown here. The ball hits the wall and comes back with the same speed. If we choose our positive direction towards right, the force that the wall exerts on the wall as a function of time looks like this. So let us apply the, our momentum change impulse theorem here. The change in momentum, which is equal to P2 minus P1, is going to be m times v times the unit vector in the positive x direction, final velocity, which is plus mv xz, minus its initial velocity, which is minus mv times the unit vector in the x direction, which gives us 2 times mv xz. So this quantity is also equal to the integral of the force during the collusion, say from time t1 to t2, where the force exerted on the ball is non-zero. So this integral is equal to the area under this curve. So if we know the collusion time, let's call it delta t, this is going to be equal to the average force times delta t. So if we know the collusion time, we can calculate the average force using this equation. The total momentum of a system of particles is a very useful concept. So let us start with studying the motion of just two particles along a line, which is shown here. Let us choose a coordinate axis like this, with positive direction to the right. We have an origin from which we measure distances. And we have denoted the positions of the first and second particle with x1 and x2, respectively. Their velocities are v1 and v2. So simply, the total momentum is defined as the sum of the momenta of the individual particles, m1 v1 plus m2 v2. So I want to write this total momentum as a product of the total mass times some velocity. So let me therefore rewrite this equation j 
just by dividing and multiplying by the total mass. So you see we get this combination of coordinates, a weighted average of their positions. So this combination will also appear naturally when we write down Newton's equations of motions for these particles. So the first particle, the equation of motion for the first particle is going to be mass times acceleration is equal to the net force. We break this net force into two parts. The external force on particle one plus the interaction force with the second particle. So this F12 denotes the force on one of particle one due to particle two. Likewise, the equation for the second mass or second particle is given here. So if I add up these equations, the sum of the mass times accelerations equals this. And notice that because F12 and F21 are, is an action reaction pair, from Newton's third law, these two forces will cancel. And this is the whole point. Because if, let us now also introduce the center of mass coordinate. If we use this definition, you see that here the total momentum of these two particles will be the total mass times the derivative of the center of mass coordinate, which we can call the center of mass velocity. Likewise, the Newton's equation of motion give us the total mass times the second derivative of the center of mass coordinate, which is the center of mass acceleration, is equal to the net or the total external force. So we can use the center of mass coordinate of the system and treat it as a single point moving under the net external force. Three dimensions and more than two particles or for n particles, we can generalize the definition of the center of mass again as the weighted sum of the coordinates. Likewise, the derivative of the center of mass coordinate, b center of mass times the total mass, will give us the total momentum of the system of particles. And finally, the center of mass coordinates acceleration times the total mass is equal to the total external force. So we can imagine the center of the total mass of the system concentrated in a single point at the center of mass coordinate and its motion will be like a particle according to Newton's second law, where the net force is the net external force on the system. For extended objects, where the mass can be distributed continuously, we have to generalize this sum to an integral overall mass. Uh, and usually for objects that have certain symmetry, it is easy to guess where the center of mass of the system is going to be. For example, if we have a sphere or a ball, the center of mass will be at the center. If we have a rod, the center of mass is going to be in the middle if we assume uniform mass density. So what these equations tell us that in general, 
if you consider the motion, say, of a rigid object, so if I throw an L-shaped object into the air, in general, its motion is going to be complex. So it will both translate and rotate. However, the, these equations tell us that if we look at the center of mass position, it just moves as a single mass under the external force. In this case, the external force could be the gravitational acceleration due to Earth. And then the center of mass motion will be the projectile motion that we have studied before, that you have seen before. Uh, and also, in general, when you study the rigid body motion, you will see that the center of mass coordinate will be very convenient to describe the motion as the translation of the center of mass plus a rotation about the center of mass. So this combined motion will give us a very convenient way to describe the total motion of this object. So there is an important case when we consider the situation for a system when the total external force is zero. In this case, we say we have an isolated system. So what does this tell us? This tells us from this equation that the center of mass acceleration is zero. Therefore, the rate of change of center of mass velocity will be zero and we will have the total momentum of the system conserved. So this is the so-called conservation of momentum. And this is a general principle. It also applies in quantum mechanics. Furthermore, so this will be quite useful, for example, if we study collusion problems. During the collusion, we can assume that the external forces do almost no work, so we can neglect them, and all the forces are internal forces. And according to Newton's third law, they cancel each other because they form action-reaction pairs. So this then, this conservation of momentum, tells us that the mo total momentum of the particles before the collusion is going to be equal to the mo total momentum of the particles after the collusion. So we can use this conservation law to relate the states of the particles before the collusion to the states of the particles after the collusion. Furthermore, if the momentum of the center of mass is zero, so if the center of is mass is not moving, so it won't move and it will be at the same point which we can use again to solve certain problems where internal parts of the system are changing position.